The background to the study lies very much with the ageing of the UK population. In the UK, as in many countries throughout the world, life expectancy has been increasing, so more and more people are living into their 80s and beyond. And this means that more and more people are reaching the time in life when there are more likely to be problems with their health, they might develop disabilities, they're more likely to experience a decline in physical and mental function. And all these things pose challenges to their well-being. So it's important that we learn how to, people can help maintain their well-being. We know from um, previous research that well-being is very likely to be influenced by factors that operate over the whole of life because there's evidence, for example, that being born low birth weight can possibly increase your risk of depression and being living in an adverse environment in childhood can have an effect, long-term effect. But we also know that factors in later life, like developing an illness or a disability, can affect you. So we want to be able to weigh up the relative importance of all these things in our study. The main purpose of our research is to understand how influences operating at different stages of life affects psychological and social well-being. with three main objectives. Firstly, to examine whether cohorts vary in the psychological and social well-being, and also to explore how they differ. Um, secondly, we want to study how factors across life affect well-being. Uh, we, we will be looking at factors such as social class, social roles, birth weight, uh, body size, and childhood mental abilities. Finally, we want to examine when decline in physical and cognitive capability affects well-being, and also whether well-being in turn affects how social and physical capability declines with age. We found that most people in their cohorts had measured anxiety and depression and they are particularly important aspects of well-being and so we could bring the cohorts together to analyse these. But also in addition to analysing data that had already been collected, we thought it would be a good idea to supplement the cohorts by actually collecting some new data that were more positive things. So we were keen to get things like optimism, people's satisfaction with life and how close they were to others in social situations. We found that four of the cohorts had collected data on the hospital anxiety and depression scale. Now, as it suggests, it collects data on anxiety and depression. And these four cohorts were the Hertfordshire cohorts, the Kerfilly cohort, and the Lothian birth cohort of 1921. So what we did was actually bring them all together. We tried to find out whether people answered these questions in the same way in different regions of the country and also whether men and women answered them in the same way. You see, there are seven anxiety questions and seven depression questions. So we wanted to find out how these came together to make up these scales. Now, the first thing we found was actually quite obvious, that the two scales actually did work very well. In each of these four different cohorts and in men and women, we could best describe how they answered all 14 questions by splitting them up into anxiety and depression. But one interesting thing we found was that in different parts of the country, the questions came together in slightly different ways to make up anxiety and depression. After finding out, really for the first time in healthy old people, what the structure of the hospital anxiety and depression scale was, we thought, wouldn't it be good to bring the cohorts together to find out what caused higher and lower anxiety and depression in different cohorts? What we found there was that people who were more anxious and depressed tended to have characteristics across these different cohorts. For example, there's a personality trait called neuroticism. This is rather a lifetime tendency to have low mood and be rather anxious. It was associated with being more anxious and depressed at any one time. Also, people who were rather heavier for their height than otherwise tended to have lower mood as well. People who had physical disability also tended to have lower mood. People in more manual as opposed to professional social classes tend to have lower mood overall. 
One of our first analyses in that has been in a study called the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, and there we were very fortunate. We had people measured on a standard scale of depression over four years several times, and they were also measured in thinking skills over the same amount of times as well. And what we studied there is whether over time being lower in mood tends to push you down in your thinking skills, or being down on your thinking skills tends to lower your mood over time. And what we've actually found there is there is some indication that people who start off being a bit more depressed actually have a steeper decline in their thinking skills. Now we're not talking about big changes here, but it's very interesting that a slight lowering of mood could actually lead to some disadvantage over time in thinking skills. We've been carrying out analyses on health-related quality of life. Members of three cohorts had already completed the short form general health survey, which is also known as the SF36, and it assesses on um, physical functioning and mental health. Most of the previous research on SF36 has been carried out on younger cohorts, and we were able to demonstrate that SF36 is also a useful measure of health-related quality of life in older cohorts. Over the next year, we're hoping to finish uh, data collection of new measures of well-being where we're measuring positive mental health in people. And it's important to look at this because most of the information we've got already is about depression. And it's possible that things that make you more depressed aren't necessarily the same things that make you happier. We hope that the ultimate end result of our study will mean that we'll learn much more about the relative importance of factors over the life course on well-being in later life. And this will be important not only for people who are researchers who are studying how people might preserve and maintain well-being in later life, but also for individuals because it's possible that some of our results may throw light on things that people can do to improve their well-being. For example, we know that from some work we've done that people who are more physically active seem to have a lower risk of becoming more depressed as they get older and a lower risk of showing mental decline. And so those are some things that can possibly lead into um, the development of advice and interventions for older people.